1975, an artist determined to make something new went to a warehouse building on Pier 52 on the Hudson River in the Meatpacking District. That artist was Gordon Matter Clark. He went in with a ladder and a chainsaw and cut a trench into the floor of the warehouse. He also carved a massive new moon shape into the building's end wall. This flooded the space with light, resulting in a work of art unlike any other. Gordon called it Day's End. At the time, the piers were a gathering place for the queer community of New York, and images of the time show men sunbathing naked, reading books, having sex there. Historically, the piers had been a place of commerce. Now they were on the brink of collapse, waiting for a bankrupt city to demolish them. And within a few years, many of them were torn down, including Pier 52, and Day's End disappeared. By 2015, four decades later, just like everything else around it, the meat packing district had changed dramatically. Surprisingly, it now had even a new museum, the Whitney Museum of American Art. As the Whitney was putting the finishing touches on its own new building, the artist David Hammonds came for a visit. Talking with Adam Weinberg, the museum's director, David was looking out the window as Adam pointed out the spot where Day's End once stood. A few days later, a sketch arrived in the mail, a simple outline of the building that once stood there at Pier 52. That small, simple, elegant sketch has been turned into a massive but delicate sculpture by David Hammonds. It emerges out of the Hudson on the very spot where the original Day's End once stood, and it's also called Day's End. I think he's a champion for something about what I call the world of ideas. I have been known to say art making is participation in the world of ideas, or art does for me what religion traditionally did. It organizes a seemingly chaotic universe. He's creating something that nobody would think, you know, David Hammonds would create. (laughs) But still, it's so much about David's work because it's about this kind of ephemerality. It's about, you know, something that's kind of ghostly, that exists and does not exist at the same time, that riffs on something that riffs on something else, you know, a peer that was here that's not here anymore. Choreographer Bill T. Jones and artist Glenn Ligon have long admired David's work. It's a building without doors, without windows, without walls, without ceiling, without floor. Whitney Museum director Adam Weinberg. So it's not a building. It's sort of like a drawing because it's a, a drawing in space, but yet it's not physically a drawing, it's a sculpture. And I see it, you know, also as a container that contains nothing and a container that contains everything. You look through it, you see the city, you see the water, you see the light, you see the air. What you don't see, at least not immediately, is history. But the place where Day's Inn now stands has a varied and rich history that together we'll explore. I'd like to welcome you to Artists Among Us a podcast from the Whitney Museum of American Art that reimagines American art and history. I'm Carrie Mae Weems, an artist, and over the years I've given a great deal of thought to history and the way in which art can make the invisible visible. I'm also a great admirer of David Hammonds, and I'm looking forward to exploring the fascinating ways that his sculpture invites us to reflect on the past of this site, who lived there, who worked there, and then how it all changed. If you haven't heard David's name before, that's probably at least in part because he wants it that way. He prefers speaking more through his work than through his words. But his work has a lot to say about social conditions and the structures that constrain us. 
At the same time, the work is imbued with a profound sense of spirit, magic, and wonder. David's work isn't always about what you see or even what you notice. Often it's about what's invisible, but right in front of you. One time, David called me up and he said, I've done a project at 14th Street subway station. Just go over there. You're going to figure out what it is. Tom Finkelpearl curated an exhibition of David's work at PS1 in Queens in 1990. And so I went there and I, and I walked through. It was a construction site. And I looked and I said, oh, this is it. You know, it's kind of a weird shack. And then it is like, eh. And I walked all the way into the end of the platform and there was this stack of metal garbage cans, perfectly stacked. And that was it. And so I called David back afterwards and, and I said, that was it, right? And he said, of course, that was it, right? And it wasn't, he hadn't done anything. He had just sort of intervened in the city to make, get people to go to the place and look at this thing. David's made work out of, you know, helium balloons. David's made work by, you know, putting a fax machine in the gallery. David's sold snowballs on the street. David makes paintings. David makes sculptures. David makes interventions in books. Again, Glenn Ligon. All of that gives you this possibility that anything you think of fits into one's practice. So I often say that I'm a painter, but really what I want to do is make lots of different kinds of things, you know, and David is kind of the artist that gives me a kind of permission to do that. The permission that Glenn is talking about is not only important to us makers, it's also important to the viewer. It offers the viewer a chance to see the many different things that can be art. David's been making work publicly for decades. It's never been about decorating a site. It's really about engaging the city, sometimes channeling its energy and sometimes resisting it. I lived in downtown Brooklyn in the, I think in the mid 80s. And I lived near the big post office in downtown Brooklyn. And for weeks on end, I would see this guy out in the park in front of that post office nailing bottle caps onto this giant telephone pole. And I just thought, what is this? And then when the giant telephone pole was stood up, I realized, oh, it's an artwork. <laughs> and that guy was David Hammonds, and he was making this piece, I think, called Higher Goals. In Higher Goals, Hammonds transformed 40-foot telephone poles into basketball hoops, making the nets impossibly high and out of reach. In retrospect, I think what was amazing about that is he did it outside, you know. He didn't do it in the studio and then bring it somewhere. He, it was important for him to do it on site, and that's what he did. And so that kind of idea of, like, you make your work in public was quite extraordinary, I think. And it's sort of demystified by that, seeing that make and happen. So literally, I saw him doing stuff on telephone poles in the park, and I didn't think he was an artist. I just thought, oh, this is some crazy guy, you know, tapping, you know, the tops of beer bottles, <laughs> beer bottle caps onto telephone poles for weeks on end. And then it's like, oh, art, you know? <laughs> but I love that that line between, like, crazy guy and art was very porous, you know. But also I think he's, he's one of those artists that really takes his clues from the street or from the environment. In that time, people were still fighting to be seen because even some of these, you know, so-called alternative spaces in downtown New York were not showing the work of black people, people of color, etc. Making work in the streets meant David could claim the opportunities that he saw without waiting for an uh, invitation from a museum or a gallery. He did, of course, have some exhibitions, especially in a gallery called Just Above Midtown in Manhattan, an important gallery for a black and brown artist. But at the same time, he preferred working in the streets, in vacant lots, basketball courts, parks, and on street corners. And as opposed to buying materials, he preferred found objects, 
gum wrappers, chicken bones, wine bottles, bottle caps, and even snow. David's move to the street was a critical gesture, a rejection of the mainstream art world and all of its traditions. But beyond that, it also expanded his audience to include anyone who happened to be passing by. One of the beautiful things about David is that he offers the audience the richness of an art experience, whether they know they're looking at art or not. I think he's a master. Kelly Jones is an art historian who's been friends with David since the early 1980s. He's using telephone poles and decorating them with patterns made from bottle caps in 86. But these are also related to something that is really kind of not a discrete work or types of works, but something called bottle trees that he does, where he upends bottles, uh, liquor bottles, cheap liquor bottles that are strewn around in the urban space and upends them on, you know, trees just in abandoned lots and so on. You don't have to go to a gallery to see this. It's something unknown. But you look at it and you say, what's going on there? You know, and it makes you stop and think. Hammonds once guessed that he spent about 85% of his time out on the streets. He said, when I go into the studio, I expect to regurgitate these experiences of the streets, of all the social things I see, the social conditions of racism. It comes out of me like sweat. Take Higher Goals, the sculpture that Glenn Lycan unwittingly observed Hammond's making. With its mosaic of bottle caps, it's a funky but beautiful piece. At the same time, the basketball hoops 40 feet off the ground suggest futility and frustrated hopes. David made the work in 1986. That same year, Spike Lee's character, Mars Blackman, debuted his beloved Air Jordans and Run DMC wrapped an ode to Adida superstars. It was a big moment for advertisers hoping to use the dreams of basketball stardom to make young black men into high-end consumers. But David did more than simply critique the situation. With David, nothing is ever really simple. Instead, higher goals both embodies frustrated hopes and offers up a tremendous amount of visual appeal. You didn't have to choose. You could live with both the good and the bad at the same time. He's always about the kind of... the social connection with humanity in these works. So it could be transactional, where you're selling people snowballs or little baby shoes, which he also did in the 80s. Kelly is talking about David's great work, Blizzard Ball Sale. It snowed, and in a way, maybe a snowball or a snowman is maybe the first act of sculpture that any kid who grows up in the snow makes. It's the first time you actually fashion something in 3D. You know, what is the simplest version of that? A ball. So here he is, is making snowballs. Imagine several dozen balls, snowballs, laying on the ground, arranged in varying sizes from small, medium, and large, laid out on a North African blanket, set up on a street corner in Cooper Square in the East Village. This is where any number of street vendors informally came to sell all kinds of things. And then Hammonds once guessed that he was inspired to go there by a man who was selling about 30 sets of false teeth. It's one of the great regrets of my life that I did not happen to walk in. I walked in front of Cooper Union, you know, like four times a day for years. Luc Sant is an author and professor who grew up in New York. And somehow I missed the day he was selling snowballs. I'll never forgive myself. But um, reconfiguring things you're familiar with, I mean, he... Oh, he does that. He's fascinated with evanescent, with the ephemeral, and the tension between all of those things. And it's also fun. Part of his work is, you know, like I said, the social engagement, um, 
Art doesn't have to be so serious. Let's have fun with it. And, you know, people buy a lot of crazy things. Including, and this was probably not beside the point, art. Why not buy a snowball that's perfect? Made with a melon ball or whatever you're going to use, an ice cream scoop. Make perfect snowball. People will spend a buck on that, (laughs) you know, or whatever, $10 if they have money. So it's also, you know, there's ways that it deals with commerce, the kind of, uh, I'm going to sell you this and make money on kind of ephemerality, but I'm also going to have fun with this. So much of his work are found objects. So many of his works are about hiding, about covering, about what I call hiding in plain sight. You know, I mean, things that you can see, but you can't see. You know, there's many mirrors in his work, which are about everything and nothing. You know, I mean, you see everything in it, and whatever you're seeing is constantly changing. Uh, Hammonds once said, the less he does as an artist, the more artist he is. And so that statement, outside of whatever he's made, has been important. I think about that when I'm making my work. (laughs) What's the least I can do? It's not just the type of objects he makes, because he makes all these different things that, for all intents and purposes, are just kind of like little junky things, frankly. Bottles that are discarded, hair that's discarded, you know, things that are just found in every day that you would just not pay attention to. But he understands how those things relate to our social life and being and how we'll recognize that in them if he does certain things to them. If I was going to say anything about Hammonds is that he really knows humanity, the social human spirit, and is able to reflect that and talk to us through these works in a way that astounds us, amazes us, makes us laugh, makes us just be very thoughtful and meditative, but that he's able to really connect with us on things that are in our everyday life and make them really sing out with some something that's just extra special. With its sleek stainless steel frame, Day's End may appear to be different from the improvisational work that David made on the streets, but it shares the same spirit that Kelly describes. So this is the story. David was visiting Adam at the museum before the museum opened. They were talking about where Gordon Matter Clark's Days Inn once stood. I noticed he was paying attention to that, but didn't think anything about it. And that's, I think, one of the interesting things about David is, like, you might be saying something very casual, and he's taking it a completely different way. And it's the things that you think you're telling him, you think is what he's paying attention to, but he actually is paying attention to things that you're not paying attention to. The building that Gordon used to make the original days in was enormous, huge, about the size of a football field. The new moon shape that he carved into the building's western wall let in a stream of light which moved dramatically around the vast warehouse as the sun began to set. This gave the work its name, Day's End, and its reason for being. When Adam pointed out the site to David on their tour of the new museum, all of this was ancient history. The warehouse had been demolished in 1979. So it never would have occurred to us that when we were talking about Gordon Mata Clark's piece being out there in the water, that within a short time, he would send this little sketch out of the blue to us without any note on it. A few days later, a sketch arrived in the mail from David. I had no idea what he was intending, and I didn't think much about it. And we put it aside because we were focused on getting the new building open. But then some weeks later, when I looked at the sketch again, I thought maybe this was sort of a message in the bottle and that David was, in his own way, saying something to us, challenging us, enticing us, teasing us, making fun of us. Adam invited David back, 
and the sketch developed into an idea, and after five years, a work of public sculpture. He originally called it a monument to Gordon Mata Clark because he wanted it to be identified so specifically with Gordon Mata Clark. When I asked him in a meeting years ago, is it a monument? I said, it's really sort of an anti-monument in a way. And then he said to me, what did Gordon call the piece? And I said, day's end. And he said, the great tailor makes the fewest cuts. We will call it day's end. Like the sketch, Day's End is an outline of what was. It's like a spirit or a ghost, something that's there or not there, but subtle and powerful. In terms of the structure, it seemed pretty clear, actually, from David Hammond's sketch what it would be. You know, there were details that evolved over time, but I, you know, I was excited about the potential for it being quite thin in the spirit of what the sketch showed and what that would mean structurally, how that could be done. That's Guy Nordensen. He's a structural engineer who's helped artists and architects realize their visions. When you build a structure like a bridge or this sculpture, then you're out in the elements. And then, of course, the corrosion's a big deal. You're out in the salt water. And that took a while before we arrived at what we all wanted to use. We landed on a really advanced kind of stainless steel, which has a great name, Super Duplex, which is highly corrosion resistant and also happens to be very strong and very ductile. The thing should appear seamless, so it can be this ephemeral, ghost-like piece. I think that's really been the goal and the challenge of the work in many ways is how to make it appear almost magical, right? That it, it just arrived there and it was effortless. Catherine Sivik is an architect. She's been working with Yi to overcome the challenges of building a permanent sculpture in the Hudson, a dynamic, ever-changing tidal river. And I think that's kind of what's joyful about some things is they're mysterious. You don't understand how it could be made, but you know, anyone will know, like, that must have been a lot of work. But there's a kind of moment when you dust yourself off and you're like, oh, it was nothing. If you're just having the kind of framework of a building that no longer exists, there's a way that it also engages our own imaginations to, you know, fill that space, to think about that space, and to really kind of meditate on what's there and what's not there. It's really about meditating on that absence, on that invisibility. Is it an invisibility of people, of housing, you know, of certainly thinking about Native American sovereignty in those, in those spaces that may not be thought about. That kind of empty framework makes us think about what was there, not just last week, not just 10 years ago, but generations ago, before New York. I think also the relationship between David's project and Gordon Mata Clark is because Gordon Mata Clark was taking existing sites and transforming them. So that's very much David too, you know, taking taking some pre-existing thing and working with and transforming it. But in terms of his David's project here, what I like about it is you're not exactly sure what he's transforming, you know? Is it the Gordon Mata Clark piece or is it the pier itself as a structure, you know? Or is it both? In New York City, you have this notion of what the piers were, what the West Side Highway was and the sort of life around the piers. We live in our memories as much as we live in our life. I mean, the way we are with other people is based on our memories of those people, whether the memories are accurate or not. So the memories are alive and objects out in the world, whether we can physically see them there now or not, um, are, are part of the subconscious of the culture. And we act based on those memories out in the world and in the landscape. And I think art functions that way. It functions as a mnemonic device that is constantly a reminder. Well, an homage is an acknowledgement. 
you know, an acknowledgement that you, um, I mean, an acknowledgement of the past, an acknowledgement of the fact that you were not sprung forth from the forehead of Zeus, an acknowledgement that you stand on ground that's been previously trodden. You know, I mean, any any writer, any artist, and any painter, any any sculptor, any any photographer at this point has to acknowledge that their work is only made possible by the work of people who have gone by previously. So an homage is tipping your hat, tipping your hat and holding it over your heart. It's an acknowledgement. What can I say? It's a thank you note across, across time. Over the next four episodes, we'll dive deeper into what Luxon so eloquently referred to as the ground that has been previously trodden. In our next episode, we'll go back to the 1970s, to the original days and into a very different New York City. You would have walked into this dark, empty, musty, funky, <laughs> smarmy <laughs> place, sight that had, you knew, all the potential in the world. I mean, here it was, utterly abandoned on the, on the shore of the Hudson in the West Village, which at the time was a huge gay scene, and gone, whoa. I mean, this is vast. And there's something very profound happening there because there's this darkness, but beams of light are coming through, you know, little crevices. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the first episode of this five-part series of Artists Among Us, a podcast from the Whitney Museum of American Art. To learn more about the voices you've heard here, please visit whitney.org slash podcast. You'll also find Artists Among Us wherever you get your podcasts. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate the show and share it with your friends. Special thanks to the artist, David Hammonds, whose vision made this project possible. Thank you to the City of New York, the Keith Haring Foundation, Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund, and Robert W. Wilson Charitable Trust, and the many donors for their generous support to realize David Hammonds' day's end. And a special thanks to the Joan Gans Cooney and Holly Peterson Foundation, and the Marlene Nathan Meyerson Family Foundation for their support towards the creation of this podcast, Artists Among Us. Thank you to our host, Carrie Mae Weems. Additional thanks to our many podcast contributors, Adam Weinberg, Glenn Ligon, Luke Sant, Bill T. Jones, Catherine Sievet, Guy Nordenson, Tom Finkelpearl, and Kelly Jones. Special thanks to Kyle Croft, Alex Fialo, George Kamensky, Jonathan Kuhn, Gina Morrow, El Nicochea, Sofia Ortega Guerrero, Eliza Senna, Catherine Potts, Stephen Vider, Sasha Wurzel, and Liza Zapel. Original music for Artists Among Us and Day's End was created by Daniel Carter and his collaborators. This podcast was produced by Sound Made Public with Tani Katenjian, Katie McCutcheon, Jeremiah Moore, Mawena Tendar, and Philip Wood. It was produced in collaboration with the Whitney Museum of American Art by Anne Bird, Jackie Foster, and Emma Quaitman.